If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. My name is Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. And I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales and master detective novels. On today's episode, Melanie pitched Storm Boy so that we can study subtext. This 2019 film was directed by Sean Seat from a screenplay by Justin Monjo, based on the 1964 novella by Colin Teeley. Of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And we would love it if you could give our little show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Just go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. All righty, Miss Melanie. Genre. What have you got for the genre of Storm Boy? Well, I thought this very much played in the worldview maturation space. So I, and across all of the characters and the, the structure I think they're both versions of Storm Boy, so Michael as the older Storm Boy and then Storm Boy as Storm Boy. (laughs) Um, I thought they both sat in the worldview maturation. What did you have? Uh Aha. I looked at both as well. I think that the Storm Boy, like Michael as a little boy, is the main story here. But because of what I'm studying this uh, season, I wanted to look at both storylines, the primary and the secondary storyline. And I think they are both worldview as well. For young Michael or Storm Boy, I'm calling it a maturation. For older Michael, Grandpa Michael, the the wonderful Jeffrey Rush Michael, I'm calling it a worldview education. Um, But we're, we're dancing in the same, dancing to the same tune here. Yes, we are. And so I'm I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say about Storm Boy because this is actually the the movie that we watched this week is actually a remake of the 1976 movie of Storm Boy, which was the first movie that I saw at the drive-in when I was young. So, and this movie was a rite of passage for a lot of Australian children. So the more recent version, which is what we watched, has changed some of the key parts of the story. Most notably, they've added in the framing story with the older Michael, and they've also changed the ending a little bit. In the book, Stormboy and Hideaway don't fall out. Stormboy goes to boarding school, and then both father and son look forward to the school holidays when they'll meet up again. So changing the ending of the story has changed some of the subtext in the movie as it attempts to link some of the story's themes to the present day, uh, tries to form links between the present day and the past. Stormboy offers some interesting examples of subtext and the examples I'd like to focus on this week are the context of the movie the sounds, and how the weather was used in three ways to create the visual atmosphere of the film. And it was also used to support a myth and also the sounds of the weather and the birds are important in this film too. So there will be some good and simple examples of each of these elements, but also examples of what happens when subtext is brought into the open when it should potentially remain under the surface. So when I talk about the context of the story, I'm talking about where it's set and what period of time it's set in. And by choosing an Australian movie that most overseas listeners would not have seen before, I'm trying to highlight how some of the events, symbols and meaning in the movie would have been lost on you. And this is because there are parts of the movie that include uniquely Australian references and symbols. Now, this also translates in reverse as well. So if you're writing um, from the experience of another country or setting in another country, even if something is successful overseas, there will be parts of the story that are probably lost because they may not, because the people watching it may not have some of the context or the subtlety, understanding of the subtleties 
that you're layering into your story. So this doesn't mean that you can't follow the story and like I mentioned, it might mean that you don't get everything that, say, in this movie an Australian would pick up. So, for example, Fingerbone Bill uses the terms white fella and black fella. Now, this isn't too much of a stretch to understand what he means, but these phrases may seem strange to non-Australians. So they were commonly used in the 60s and 70s and are still used today, although probably not as much. So it's phrases like this that provide me with a sense of the period that the movie is set in. And there are also geographical and cultural references in the film that you may not have picked up on. So last week I said that subtext is felt before it's seen and this week some of the subtext actually made my spidey senses tingle for the wrong reasons. So there were two aspects of the story for me that weren't right and the first was the framing device. So the frame, the framing at the start of the story has a number of symbols and visual references that are specific to some current issues Australians are grappling with. The protesters out the front of the company building in Adelaide are carrying umbrellas with red and yellow handprints on them. So red, yellow and black are the colours on the Aboriginal flag and the handprint paintings are well-known symbols in Aboriginal rock art. So Valerie, I'm curious to know if you noticed the protesters and understood what the symbols and the colours on the umbrellas meant. I definitely noticed the protesters, but no, I didn't know what the colours or symbols meant. However, it is referenced later in the film. They're not talking specifically about those symbols, but the fact that there's a debate over the land does come up. Madeline sends her grandfather an article for him to read and we see the headline of it. And also Madeline's father counters her argument by saying that the Aboriginal leaders are at the bargaining table and that those issues have already been dealt with. Now, to be honest, <laughs> I, have, I have to be honest, I was much more focused on the nicknames that they were using in the movie because you once told me that Australians tend to shorten everyone's names. And since you told me that, I whenever I watch an Australian film or I hear a- actors who are Australian being interviewed, I'm, I'm listening to see if they're going to shorten uh, anyone's name. And they, you're right. <laughs> of course you're right. Being Australian, you would know this. So Madeline is Maddie or Mats. And I was, I was really fascinated by that. And just a little name drop here. I just came back from New York and I saw Hugh Jackman on stage be still my heart. And then I heard an interview with him and he said he was referred to as Jax growing up. That was his nickname, Jax. All right. Anyway, I'm going to start thinking about Hugh Jackman now. Let's think about pelicans instead. <laughs> pelicans, pelicans, pelicans. Okay. So you did this. <laughs> So you mentioned the framing story. I'm going to circle back to that because it also caught my attention. (laughs) Sorry, please continue. (laughs) All right. So, you know, as in most countries, native titles or, you know, land rights for Indigenous people, and in this case, Indigenous Australians, and the destruction of sacred sites by mining companies are contentious. And because Australia is home to the oldest living culture in the world, so some of the rock art that's been destroyed to clear um, way or make way for mining sites, and these are recent stories, so some of these rock art places are, you know, the paintings on them are over 46,000 years old. And some companies have used unethical methods to trick Aboriginal tribes into selling their land And in some cases, state governments have also changed laws at short notice to remove Aboriginal land claims so that mining projects can go ahead. So that's some of that context that sits around the the Maddie storyline. And even though her father talks about, well, the elders are at the table, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's done the right thing. So there's some subtext there based on, you know, recent and and not so recent Australian history that, um, again, brings, I understand, as, as 
what they're trying to say there. But from outside Australia, you might not know that. However, there's probably enough commonality in there for people to understand really what, what's going on. Also, the framing story, I think, uses a nondescript mining company founded by Michael, who is Storm Boy, and he's handed this company over to his son-in-law to run, and that's Maddie's father. So the company, I think, are voting on a business development opportunity, and this is the setup for the father-daughter tension between Malcolm and Maddie. And it's also the catalyst for Storm Boy's return or Michael's return and his retelling of the Storm Boy story to Maddie. So the protesters, and there's some issues I have around this as well. So the protesters at the start of the movie hold up signs saying no mining in the Pilbara. But the Pilbara is in northern Western Australia and Storm Boy is set in South Australia in Coorong at the mouth of the Murray River, where the Murray River meets the Southern Ocean. Now, most Western Australian mining companies have headquarters in Perth, not Adelaide. And then Maddie and Michael fly to Coorong via helicopter, so they must be in Adelaide, not Perth. Anyway, this whole thing doesn't make much sense to me and is probably lost on a lot of people, but it's interesting to see how that framing device fits in does it really work in an Australian context and I had I didn't think it did so the second part of the story that wasn't quite right for me either was when Michael is telling Maddie the story about leaving his father to go to boarding school and as much as Michael says he was upset by the prospect of going and that he didn't speak to his father ever again after he left I didn't think there was any tension throughout the movie between Hideaway and Storm Boy that supports this outcome. You know, sure, Storm Boy was upset that he was going away to school, but his father is always supportive of him in the Storm Boy storyline. You know, he cared, especially when Storm Boy was caring for the Pelicans. So the only potential conflict between the two could have been when Hideaway says that he wishes he didn't have anyone to care about so that when they died or left, it wouldn't hurt. And and Stormboy does hear this comment, but he actually doesn't have any reaction to it when he does hear it, or it doesn't even seem to register. Now, in the book, Stormboy actually decides to leave Kurong after Mr Percival dies. And he and his father, as I mentioned, look forward to the school holidays when Stormboy will return home. And that point when Storm Boy decides to leave is the realisation of the maturation story in the book. However, the movie moves the maturation point for Storm Boy's story into the framing story. Well, this is what I think is happening. So it's taken Storm Boy until old age to reconcile Mr Percival's death and leaving his father. I also think... Storm Boy is meant to be a lesson for Maddie in the framing story. And again, this doesn't ring true for me because the relationship between Maddie and Malcolm is completely different from the one between Storm Boy and Hideaway. Now, the ending of the young Storm Boy story, though, is a universal problem in the story. If Hideaway really didn't care about Storm Boy, he'd be more neglectful. He wouldn't help Storm Boy with the pelicans. I think a minor change in the relationship between Hideaway and Storm Boy could have made Storm Boy's decision never to speak to his father again more consistent. However, this would have been a significant variation from the book and from the original movie. So I think the writers may have created a problem for themselves by adding the framing story in this remake because they tried to link the story set in 1967 to the same story being told in 2019. Now, I'm pointing this out as an example of why it's important to understand how all elements of the story must work together. Be aware of the subtext or your subtext and how it's working to support or undermine the story that you're telling. So you may not have picked up on all of the geographical details, 
But the audience for this movie is mainly Australians, and most of us are aware of the locations and distances, and that's why it doesn't quite gel. And again, it comes back to the feelings that you get when things are not quite right in a movie. So the big lesson out of this could be don't remake a classic movie and mess with a formula that's worked before. So Valerie, did you want to make a comment about the framing of the story in this movie? This is really interesting. You've already picked up on a couple of the things that I've also picked up on. And for anyone who's new to the show, Melanie and I study our study the movie separately and we do our notes and everything totally separately. And we come together here on the call and discuss what we've come up with. And this isn't the first time we've both picked up on the same couple of issues that it sort of made our spidey senses tingle and not in a good way, as Melanie said. Uh, one of them that I'll talk more about, Melanie, is um, this lack of conflict. And you mentioned it specifically between Storm Boy and his dad, Hideaway Tom. I also talked about that. I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a minute. Um, the framing story, you're absolutely right. I picked up on a number of that, those things as well. Um, now, I'm focusing on the middle this uh, week, but I absolutely noticed what you're talking about. And I want to talk a bit more about using framing stories later of obviously the geographical thing. I just went with it. I didn't pick that up at all. Uh, my geography of Australia is rusty. <laughs> I say rusty, like it was ever sharp to begin with, but <laughs> I was going to say, it's probably about as good as my geography of knowledge of Canada. <laughs> okay. We're fair. We're even, Yeah, <laughs> I know where you live. <laughs> I can find you on a map. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the same, the same. <laughs> I, I have been to Canada though, so I um to a couple of different places. But yes, you got one day I oh <laughs> well maybe when Hugh Jackman's here you can come over. Oh, Hugh Jack- no, stop it. I have to think about pelicans. All right. Keep All right, going. Okay. Back to the movie. <laughs> All right. So while it's probably obvious, the bird sounds in the film are used to increase tension and remind us of what makes 90 Mile Beach and the Coorong Lagoon a special place. The lagoon is a destination for over 230 migratory birds from Siberia, Alaska, Japan and China. Plus, it's a significant breeding ground for the Australian pelican. Bird noises, winds and rain are consistent throughout the movie and they help create the feeling of how remote Storm Boy, Hideaway and Fingerbone are. And with so many bird noises, we are very aware of what is happening or what could happen when the sound of gunshot rings out. So this is obviously a threat to the birds, especially Messrs Proud, Ponder and Percival. So from the moment we hear the first gun go off, we know that there will be some sort of showdown with the hunters. And I just want to pause here because there are a lot of lessons to be learned from this movie and one of them is about conflict or the lack of it and the undefined nature of it. So I hope I'm not stealing some of your thunder, Valerie. But (laughs) So the clashes between the hunters, Storm Boy, Hideaway and Fingerbone could have raised the stakes of the movie a lot more. The impact of hunting on the the birds and the pending decision to make the region a nature reserve could have created more conflict for the main characters as well. And this was a lost opportunity and it was a point of conflict, I think, that we were actually set up to expect. Now, the other lesson this movie teaches us about conflict is that it needs to be defined So we see how an undefined conflict like the one between Maddie and her father makes it difficult for us to care about the same things as the characters. Our empathy is reduced. So in Michael's story, I did find it hard to care about Maddie's conflict with her dad just because I didn't understand exactly what that conflict was about. Right, so the weather also is used quite a lot in Storm Boy to create or articulate the underlying mood in certain scenes or events. Now, Valerie talked about how the weather at the start and finish of the Bourne identity represented Bourne's state of mind at these point at those points in the film. 
So rain, thunder and storm clouds are used at certain points in Storm Boy to either indicate that a storm is brewing or a storm is underway. So the weather is used in both Michael and Storm Boy's storylines. We first meet Michael with his head against the car window and raindrops on the outside. As Michael's storyline progresses, the weather clears. Michael, who is, in, who is mourning the loss of his daughter and is under pressure to vote on a company decision he isn't in favour of, is returning from an overseas holiday. The clouds and the rain are symbolic of the lack of clarity that Michael is experiencing at the start of the movie. And once he remembers what matters to him by retelling Maddie about Mr Percival, the sky becomes much clearer and he knows what he must do to stop the company from make a decision from making a decision he doesn't like. In the Storm Boy storyline, the weather is used more to signal impending trouble for Storm Boy and Mr Percival. But it also has a supernatural element to it. Fingerbone tells Storm Boy that there will be storms if a pelican is killed and the weather does turn bad when the hunters shoot the pelicans. So, for example, the death of the pelicans precedes the incident where Hideaway is caught on the water in a storm and his boat capsizes. Now, Fingerbone's connection to the land and the natural world is also reinforced via the myth about pelicans dying because it, seemed to bring, it seems to bring truth to the myth. And, of course, there's the nickname of the protagonist, which is Storm Boy. And this is actually not explained in the movie, but it is explained in the book. So in case you're wondering, there is a reason why he gets that name. Um, and I won't go into it in detail here. But if the weather, so one of the things that I noticed that is, it, is that if the weather is going to be a feature of a story, then a writer must also consider the setting of the story so that the weather is plausible. Now, Coorong and 90 Mile Beach, where the movie is set and filmed, is subject to winds from the Antarctic, so it's no surprise that it's a rugged piece of coast with strong cold winds and changeable weather. So it does, in the context of the movie, the weather makes, set, uh, the weather makes sense in terms of the setting. So there are some good examples of how subtextual elements help build and reinforce the atmosphere reflect the protagonist's moods and signal a rise in tension. There are also some lessons to be learned from a negative perspective. Subtextual elements must enhance your story and not undermine it. And in today's action step, I'll suggest a way for you to test if your subtext is working for or against you. Now, Valerie, over to you about the middle of this movie. Okay, well, you did steal a little bit of my thunder, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. So last week I talked about knowing which structural form you want to use in your story. And here's what I said. In order to really nail the middle part of your story, you must understand and decide the structural form that your story is going to have. So to do that, you have to ask yourself questions like, how many protagonists does my story have? Is my story linear? Am I using a framing story? And if so, why? Am I using flashbacks? And if so, why? How many plot lines does my storyline have? And how many points of view does my story have? So the answers to these questions will determine whether you're writing an arc plot story, which is also called a classical story structure, a multi-plot story, a mini plot story, or an anti-plot story. Last week, we studied Whiplash, which is a great example of an arc plot or classic story form. Storm Boy is a different beast, totally different beast. It has two storylines happening, as Melanie's already been talking about. There's the modern day storyline with Michael as the grandfather. I think that's the secondary storyline. And then there's Michael's childhood when he's known as Storm Boy. That's the primary storyline. Now, the film opens with the modern day story which is the secondary storyline. We're, we're kind of thinking it's going to be the main storyline because that's how it opens. And we've been referring to it as a framing story so far, but, you know, and it is, but it's quite a robust storyline, quite a robust framing story. It's more than, you know, a simple framing story that you might expect, but it's not 
as developed as a full mini plot story. So for example, the water horse that we did last season, that's a better example of a, a framing story in my opinion, but anyway, we'll go with it. The secondary storyline uh, opens and closes the movie and it stars the amazing Jeffrey Rush, but it doesn't get a lot of screen time, not a lot at all. And that means it just doesn't have time to fully develop into its own powerful story. Uh, and everything that Melanie said about the, the plot holes and the things not making sense, I just want to say ditto to all that. But there is enough storyline here in the secondary story for me to sort of suss out a bit of a genre, which I think is worldview education. Michael is coming back to his roots, so to speak. He's remembering what's important to him and what's meaningful and that's why I've called it a worldview education story. The primary story is that of young Michael or Storm Boy. Now, before I go on, I want to just talk a little bit about this for a minute. The film, Storm Boy, has a very complicated structure. This isn't something you want to try in your first novel or even one of your first five novels. There's a whole lot of moving parts here and a whole lot of traps and this film even fell into a number of them. <laughs> uh, I am asking you to take my word for that, but most of you won't. I know that. Most of you will think that your story is different and therefore it must be stole, told with a really complex structure. Most of you are just going to have to try and pull it off yourselves to understand how difficult it is. That's fine. Good luck. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> the number one challenge with this kind of a story form is holding your reader's attention. There are other ones, as we've talked about, plot holes, holy plot holes, but holding your reader's attention is the biggest challenge when you start monkeying with uh, framing stories and nonlinear stuff and all that kind of stuff. It's hard enough to write an arc plot story, but with this structure... Honestly, it's 50 times harder, harder, and that is not an exaggeration. Now, why am I saying that? Well, if you've got two storylines, you got to do twice the work. Everything that you do for one storyline story, you got to do again for the second storyline. Not easy. At the start of any novel or any film or any story, you have to do a lot of things. You've got to introduce the characters in your world. You've got to introduce the objects of desire and all that kind of stuff. And you have to do it in a way that captivates a reader's attention. And just when you get that done, you yank the rug from under your reader's feet and you toss them into a whole new story with a whole new set of characters, a new timeline, a new place, um, new objects of desire. Your reader chooses to buy your book based on what they read in the first five to 10 pages. That's the story that your reader is expecting to get. But rather than give her that story, you then switch course and start telling a secondary story that she may or may not be interested in. So if we think about this film, Storm Boy, the first bit, five to 10 minutes, is the secondary storyline. It's the Jeffrey Rush character, and it's all about the, the mine and the land and all that kind of stuff. So that's the story that I was expecting, because I came at this film cold. I didn't know the book or the, or the, the movie from 76 or any of that kind of stuff. And then when we're, but it didn't make sense with the movie poster. <laughs> I'm like, where's the little boy? Where's the birds? What's happening here? And then we're transported back to Michael's childhood. And that's where we stay for most of the screen time. So it's not what I thought it was going to be. So I had to adjust my expectations. You might get away with that. You might not. It's really hard to do. And then once you've gotten your reader used to the second story, you pull them out of that and flip them back to the first storyline. So throughout the novel or the film, in this case, you're constantly moving back and forth between two storylines. Now, in a film, it's a bit easier to get away with this because when we come out of Storm Boy's story and go to you know Grandpa Michael's storyline, I only timed it for the middle build, but it's five minutes. In the whole middle build, it's five minutes in the Jeffrey Rush storyline. 
And I don't think, I think the longest is a minute. I don't think there are any two minute breaks. So a passive movie watcher can sit back and look at a screen for a minute and just kind of get there because it's easier to sit there and watch it than get up and turn it off. (laughs) But reading a novel is an active activity. It takes work to read a book. And every time you switch storylines, your reader is going to work harder. And it's, they're not being switched for a minute or two. It could be an hour or two or a week or two, depending on how much the switch, how much of a switch you have there, how quickly a reader reads, how often they read. They might read a little bit today and might not pick up the book again for another two weeks. It's much harder to get away with in a novel. That's all I have to say. Now, if this isn't complicated enough, the primary story of Storm Boy contains within it flashbacks to the day that his mother and sister died. And there's even a voiceover, but voiceovers don't apply to novelists. It's used in the film as a transition technique to hold the viewer's attention through one of the storyline switches. This is not for the faint of heart. Very difficult to pull off. And these are professional, this is a group of professional storytellers with a script that was strong enough to attract the likes of Jeffrey Rush, and they struggled to pull it off. All right, so let's look at the middle of, or act two of Storm Boy. Well, the whole movie breaks down like this. So the beginning is about 23%, the middle is about 56%, and the end is about 21%. Of the middle... 85% is Storm Boy's story, and Grandpa Jeffrey Rush, (laughs) his storyline is about 15%, which works out to, like I said, about five minutes of screen time. Not much. So within Act 2, both storylines actually have a bit of a structure. So let's look at the primary storyline first, because it's 85% of the second act. All right, last week I talked about dividing act two in half, and then those halves can be further broken down into sequences. And following the sequence work that Melanie did last season, this equates to sequences three, four, five, and six. Between the two halves is something called a midpoint shift, and that usually comes right in the middle of the whole movie, at the halfway point of the whole movie. As soon as act two begins, we see the protagonist adjusting to his extraordinary world again and acting the same way he would in the ordinary world, because of course he's still the same person he was at the beginning of the film. We saw this with Whiplash. There hasn't been any significant change in character yet, because the first test that they come across is the beginning of the character change. Now in sequence three, Storm Boy is being tested by looking after the pelicans on his own. Of course, he has a mentor in Fingerbone Bill, but it's ultimately his responsibility. His father is also a mentor figure. He's a loving and supportive dad who's called Hideaway Tom. So in terms of conflict then, and Melanie, you've, you just talked all about this. The conflict is not about the people. Fingerbone and Hideaway become friends and they both support Storm Boy. The conflict isn't even between Hideaway Bill and Storm Boy and the community, because the community think that this is great. They even spot him some money. They spot Tom some money when he doesn't have enough to buy groceries for his son. And they give him fish for the Pelicans. So there's no conflict on that level at all. The conflict here in sequence three is between Storm Boy and nature. And the question that the audience is asking is, will the pelicans survive? More specifically, will the weak little pelican survive? And this becomes Mr. Percival, of course. And this sequence is about 10 minutes long. So the next sequence, sequence four, is nearly twice as long. Over the course of 19 minutes, we see the pelicans get stronger and grow. We see the community supporting both Storm Boy, Hideaway Tom, and the birds. There's a lot of feel-good storytelling here, but there's only a hint of conflict. And that's when Hideaway tells his son that the birds will have to be released back into the wild. And of course he's right, but that doesn't make the news any easier for Storm Boy to receive. The scenery here is 
gorgeous. And the birds are fascinating. I have to admit, I kept wondering, are these real birds or are these CGI birds? So I, I did a quick Google search and they are real birds. You can train pelicans. Who knew? Not me. That amazed me as well. Like, how did they train the pelicans so well for that movie? Like it it was and they're big birds, right? With massive beaks. But I that was, I thought, one of the most fascinating things about the movie is looking at how did they train those pelicans? Because that was pretty impressive. Very impressive, but a problematic for the writer because we're talking more about how did they train the birds, right? So Although what is really cool, look, if you've not seen this movie, it's worth to just look at these birds. They are, they're magnificent. I've never seen a real pelican. We don't have them here in Newfoundland. The poor things have freeze to death. Anyway, <laughs> so in terms of conflict, there's not a whole lot of it in this section and it's 19 minutes. That's a lot of screen time. But there is a looming threat to the birds. There is a lingering question in our minds, and Melanie, you you alluded to this a minute ago. What we're wondering is this. When the birds are released, will they be shot by the hunters? Um, the midpoint shift is when Hideaway Tom and Storm Boy release the birds. This is heartbreaking. I felt for, for Storm Boy there. I didn't want the pelicans to go either. The midpoint shift plunges the main character into chaos. And when the main character is in chaos, everybody else, all the other characters and everything else, the whole fictional world is in chaos too. So what happens? Well, initially in sequence five, Storm Boy is lonely, right? The birds are gone. The chaos is entirely internal. The hunters are continuing to hunt and there is a move afoot to get the area turned into a sanctuary. However, Storm Boy, Hideaway, and Fingerbone are not involved in the campaign to create a sanctuary. Now, I don't know what was in the original novel or the other movie, but in this movie, that is a real missed opportunity as far as I'm concerned. And in this sequence, we get a lot of backstory here provided in flashback. Hideaway is telling, this is pure exposition, he's telling Fingerbone what happened to his wife and daughter. Now, it doesn't matter for the sake, for the sake of this story. It really doesn't matter. All of those flashbacks could have been removed because the story isn't about how they died. It's not about Hideaway Tom's arc. It's about Storm Boy. He is the, the primary protagonist here. So it's enough to know that his mother and sister have died. We don't need to waste a lot of storytelling time talking about how they died, especially when we have a story that is... Um, deficient in conflict. <laughs> um, and of course, here in this sequence, this is when Mr. Percival returns. So while Storm Boy is conflicted internally, and while there is inner turmoil, it's not particularly reflected in the external world just yet. And Melanie, you're right, there is nothing in so far in this movie, or even in the next sequence that I'm about to talk about, that would indicate that Storm Boy would have such a serious falling out with his father that he would never speak to him again. Uh, so the last sequence, sequence six of the middle build of the story, act two of the story, um, there's lots of external conflict here and chaos. Because uh, we have the hunter who approach, or the hunters, I should say, um, approaching Storm Boy and Mr. Percival directly when they're in the town, when the dog starts to go after Mr. Percival and then the hunters come over. And the older guy, the older hunter says, bad things can happen just like that. Don't say I didn't warn you. Because he thinks Storm Boy is there trying to make a point about the um, sanctuary. And Storm Boy says no, which for the global story is a problem. They should be there making a point. They should absolutely be there making a point. Especially since the whole community loves Mr. Percival. So also in sequence six, we have Mr. Percival taking on the hunters and he stops them from killing any more birds. Yay for Mr. Percival. I was very happy about that. Nervous that he was going to get shot, but happy that he triumphed. Um, and there is really a lovely bit of storytelling sym symmetry here. The act ends the way it began with a man against nature conflict. So in the opening of act two, 
the conflict was storm boy against nature as he cared for the newborn birds, right? Because nature could have taken those birds. Here at the end of Act 2, Hideaway is caught at sea and is in danger of drowning. So when the act opened, humanity was saving the birds, right? A boy was saving the birds. At the end of the act, the bird is saving the man, right? So it's a lovely bit of symmetry here. Of course, Fingerbone and Stormboy are also helping save Hideaway. So what I love about Mr. Percival, and we see this all of the time in stories like this, is that we have Mr. Percival behaving as the bridge that connects man and nature. Now, Fingerbone is that too, in a way. He respects nature. He understands the importance of nature. But he isn't as much a part of nature as Mr. Percival is. Mr. Percival has one little webbed foot in each world. So although the bulk of Act 2 is occupied with the primary story, there isn't a whole lot of storytelling happening. There's a lot of beautiful images, gorgeous footage, and montages of the birds growing up and interacting with the storm, with storm boy. Uh, it's visually pleasing. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You can't question it at all. And the filmmakers can get away with it, especially in a children's film. But I don't think a novelist could get away with it. In fact, I know a novelist couldn't get, couldn't get away with it. There isn't enough there in a novel, which takes work to read. It's an active form of story creation. There isn't enough there to keep a reader reading this particular story on the page. So I'm curious what the actual novel is like. Now, in a novel, like I said, there has to be more story. Long passages of exposition or description or pages where nothing really happens. Those are the places where readers get bored. Now, that said, a lot of the story is happening within Storm Boy, and that's very difficult to convey visually. So in the novel, in, in this novel or our novels that we're writing, we can go right inside a character's head if we want to, and a filmmaker can't do that. But if even then, even in doing that, if we want to retain our reader's attention, we still have to find ways to externalize the inner turmoil. All right, the secondary storyline. In the secondary storyline, there's a nod at structure, but it, you know, like I said, this is only five minutes of the middle build. So obviously this is highly abbreviated. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that just like in the water horse, the story's structure and genre are literally stated by the main character. This is kind of fun. Just before the midpoint shift, Michael says, any story that's good has to go wrong before it gets better. And what happens just after this in any story, this is the chaos phase, right? Where everything just goes haywire. And for older Michael's storyline, his midpoint shift is when he asks for the original charter. In the last little bit of the storyline here in the second act, Michael states the genre. He says to his granddaughter, sometimes you forget the best things you've ever learned, like how to live like a pelican. This is his epiphany. All right, so what's the bottom line here? Well, the bottom line is that this is a really complicated story for him to pull off. And if you're writing a novel that has multiple storylines and multiple points of view, study novels that use the same form. Films will be of limited assistance here, I think, because they can and do use spectacle to hold a viewer's attention. And we do not have access to spectacle. As novelists, what we've got is words on a page in our readers' imaginations. That's it. All right, Melanie, what have you got for today's action step? Right, so, so if you have a scene in your story that uses subtext to add extra layers, ask someone to read it and then ask them specific questions. For example, what did the thunder signify to you? Or did you notice the setting and what does it mean? And this way, I think you'll be able to actually tell if your subtext is supporting your story or if it's taking away from your story. And that wraps it up for another week. Join us again next week when we discuss Back to the Future. Woohoo! 
To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and help us spread the word by telling your writer friends about us. And if you're on social media, please like and share our posts. For even more information about putting story theory to practice, subscribe to my inner circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to find out more about Melanie, visit melaniehill.com.au or visit her on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Melanie Hill Author. And remember, story theory does not have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.